So I just want to say uh, up front that I'm deeply appreciative of this uh, uh, group of actors who have decided for us to be able to pull ourselves together to do this. Uh, I think it might also be just that, just at outset, I can sort of introduce myself. Uh, originally a journalist, uh, several years, and I suspect that, did I see Ibrahima fall in the room? Uh, 15 years ago, I was doing my first IPCC meeting in, uh, uh, in, uh, in Canada, uh, not, not ICC, a uh, UNFCCC meeting. Uh, and I have attended several of those, including the Rio meeting and the 2015 uh, Paris meeting uh, as a young reporter and sometimes training journalist. Uh, of course, I do wear different hats right now. Uh, very appreciative to Corab that has offered me more or less a laboratory to be able to experiment my work with respect to institutional communications. Uh, and prior to that, I did, did I do some work for the African Development Bank. So you might see me identified in the report as African Development Bank, but that's actually uh, an error because I'm actually caught up right now. But I used to work for, for the African Development Bank in Abidjan before, uh, and even before that at the World Bank in, 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 in Washington, D.C. So a little bit of sustainable communications, more or less, is my area. This report, just at outset, more or less, it's another kind of analytical work unlike perhaps the IPCC that essentially focuses on, on, on climate, right? Or the biodiversity one that essentially focuses on biodiversity. This one sort of brings together news, science, research. Uh, there was a team of like 20, including the editorial team, and of course uh, the, uh, the writers who are all spread across the continent. In Africa, I think you had me as part of the editorial team and another colleague based in a university in Southern Africa. And so uh, the preface was uh, uh, the, uh, the document, the forward is written by the former pr uh, Prime Minister of Norway. What she says in the report, I think, is two things, and we're going to see a lot of the nuances in this report, which is that it is important for us to be able to continue the system of multilateralism. Of course, that's seriously questioned with populism and all of what you know at this point. And she also says in the report, of course, that we might the movement of conservation and development might have started several decades ago, but it all remains pretty important at this point and we need to continue in that direction. Vince is a colleague based in London. He wrote just uh, with respect to the, uh, the, the, the introduction. But I'd say that at outset, you'd realize that he sort of combines a whole set of issues that are raised in this report into an introduction, into a compelling introduction. And what he tries to say at that, it's mostly the fact that humans do have a part to play in what we are having now in terms of the, the world, the planet that we have at this point. What does that simply mean? It means that we are entering a certain epoch where the human, or you and I, are affecting the overall direction of the world more than any other variable. And I think that's important. Some people call it Anthropocene. Essentially an epoch where human beings are having more impact on uh, the trajectory of the world than anything else. That's essentially what it means. If you look at those graphs, <coughs> what has been termed the, termed the Great Acceleration, it essentially tells you on the one side, on the left, the economic, uh, so look at the economic factors. If you look at the economic factors, essentially what that means, of course, is socioeconomic dimensions. Take world population. Uh, Dr. Gay just raised that a few minutes ago. And uh, Benoit, of if I just said that a few minutes ago, in the last 50 years, we've seen population literally going from when he was born 2 billion to how many now? 7.5. And we are looking at 9 billion in the next 10 years or so. You could look at any other indicator on the socioeconomic side, and you're going to see exactly that the trend is what we have right there on the board. It's all in red, I suspect, for a purpose. But it just tells you that in the last 50 years or so, you've had more in terms of urban population. You've seen a growth, exponential growth, water use, building of dams, fertilizer consumption, transportation, telecommunication. Any indicator that you take, what you see in the last 50 years has been an exponential growth. If you look at the F system trends, what you see on the other side is carbon dioxide, for instance. It's on the increase. If you look at, of course, we're going to talk a little bit about that in terms of the 415 parts uh, per million. That's the last measurement that was done last year. That's so significant in terms of the quantity uh, of carbon dioxide concentration in the atmosphere. Are we working to be able to reverse that? Can we continue with that trend? Is it sustainable? Those are questions that we can all ask. And you can look at any of them, whether it's uh, nitrous oxide, methane, uh, I don't know, surface temperature. You can look at any and see how the growth has gone. And it's only in the last 50 years. 
Of course, these issues are all identified in the IPCC. The next thing, and I think this is a little bit novel with respect to this report, is that we made a determination to speak to some of the scientists around the world. So we went out, administered a questionnaire, and asked them what they thought could be the next major risk. And I'll tell you, terrorism wasn't at the top. What was at the top was water, it was extreme weather conditions, it was issues with respect to uh, climate change. These are the next threats to our to businesses and to our overall collective existence. You're going to see the bubbles and see how they are all interconnected. So extreme weather, urban planning, uh, <coughs> biodiversity loss, this was also identified as one of the biggest threats of our time. And if you move on to the next slide, you then see compared impact and likelihood and what it tells you is that, if you look at the size of the bubble, is that water crisis, biodiversity, man-made disasters, climate change, their impact are likely to be higher and the likelihood that that's going to occur is a lot higher. Take for instance in 2019, November was the hottest month in Africa. It's the, hot, the hottest on record, we've never had that before. This is scientific, of course this is not coming from David. What that tells you exactly is that the world, of course, is not on a sustainable trajectory. That's a figure coming out of last year, and I just told you about in terms of CO2 concentrations in the atmosphere. We've never hit 415 parts per, per million, but we had that in, uh, in 2019. What's going to happen in 2020, we don't know yet. Of course, you all live in Dakar, and you see how unpredictable everything is in terms of whether when is it going to rain, when is it hot, when is it cold, and all of that sort of thing. Think with economic relationships. And there is, of course, science that underpins all of this. I think that's important. Dialing down the heat, and I wish that we could actually be dialing down the heat. This is not happening anytime soon. IPCC, which is, of course, the Intergovernmental Panel for Climate Change, the group of experts have said that we need to be able to keep temperatures under two degrees centigrade if we are going to build a sustainable world. But on the trajectory that we are on, we would obviously not be able to reach that goal. It is, it is sure, it is clear that we can we, we can get there. And of course, <clears throat> the countries have made pledges. The last in uh, uh, the, the last uh, IPCC made, uh, or UNFCCC meeting in December, dating back to the Paris Accord, was let's keep uh, emissions at two uh, 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 global temperatures at two degrees centigrade uh, before uh, 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 industrialization. Are we going to be able to meet that? That's obviously a question that I suspect we can have a discussion on. Uh, but there is a lot that is said about uh, climate change uh, globally and of course around the region. And we are going to see the interconnectedness with migration, with food systems, because I think that's important. Migration in the sense that I understand the uh, IOM is here and I'm glad that they made it. Of course they can talk a little bit about the sort of climate uh, induced sort of migration. That's happening in our region, I suspect, and we all know this. Uh, we can talk a little bit about uh, how much that is influencing the water system and all of that. Uh, if you move on to the next slide, you're going to see there's a little bubble there in Africa, and what it essentially says here is that Africa had the warmest in November on record last year in 2019. Those are the other extremes around the world, and I'm just speaking to stay on our area in our region, which is very uh, uh, important to us. And you can look anywhere else in the world and you're going to see that there was just so many things that happened. In Europe, for instance, Europe had the test warmest, warmest October on record. That was in 2019. This is important in the sense that if you're a policymaker or if you're a pro program designer, you understand the urgency. Probably your intervention may just be focused in a specific country or a specific location. But it obviously has an impact in terms of uh, the sort of resilience that we want to build as a community, isn't it? I love the next <coughs> chapter, which is essentially about populism. This is a little bit about politics, and if you move on to the next slide, if you don't mind, you might have obviously been part of the whole discussions about <coughs> the rise of right-wing movements, sometimes left-wing movements across the world. Should we talk about the United States and the rise of Donald Trump? I'm not a politician, and I don't intend to be able to raise this as, a, I don't know what are your political affiliations in the room, but you know what happened and you know how much that is either helping or inhibiting action on climate in the united states congress right you know how much in europe these movements in britain with the brexit leaving the european union how that is affecting how we all pull ourselves as an international community to be able to do work 
this is very important that's how interconnected all of this is and what this does is it just simply says that the world has come to a certain point where because of this right wing movements that sort of try to simplify every single thing they don't like complexity anything you say is simplified of which we know that the issues we raise on every single day basis are not simply are not simple rather they're very complex you all know that but under anything known as populism everything is simple and that's why if simple catchphrases gain traction they make a lot of news and people love that sort of thing but that's not how our normal world is simple isn't it so that's what that chapter sent, sent, uh, essentially uh, talks about but it also says that it's making it harder for us to be able to make decisions as a collective group of people whether it's in the united nations system or any other system that you're thinking about that's what this is doing Ocean governance, I'm not going to talk a little bit about that because Robert, who uh, wrote this chapter, has recorded and he is going to be able to just speak a little bit with respect to that. But I talked about Greenpeace because this is something that's interesting to the resources in Senegal. A lot of people in uh, this country depend on the high seas, on the resources out there. But think about that relationship and the Chinese big uh, uh, fishery companies that are all in the region trying to get fish as much as they can and anything that they can fish, they pick it up. Of course, we're going to have a discussion on that. Uh, when we get uh, Robert to talk and I think that uh, our colleagues of Greenpeace uh, are here and are going to be, going to be able to uh, speak a little bit uh, with respect to that. I think it's also important to say that in 2020 it's important that uh, at least for the first time you're going to be seeing the international community coming together to talk a little bit about how you govern the high sea, particularly the area that's not considered to be uh, belong to any specific country and I think that's uh, raised, uh, we, uh, we, we raised that in the report, that that's important. Uh, migration just a little bit of course uh, uh, migration yeah you all know you know these issues I suspect better than I or you are working on it on a sing every single basis the quick and big figures here of course is the 800,000 Africans who are moving towards northern Africa in search of greener pastures to other parts of the world uh, that's not sustainable we know that of course people have to move economically we know that but the other issue of course it's that by moving and because of the sort of populist movements that you have in different parts of the world, people view these people coming into their countries as invaders and that makes finding a solution very hard. I think this is important for us to be able to raise at outset and I think we're going to be able to have a conversation on that. Uh, <clears throat> the next slide just tells you the bubble in terms of where they are coming from. If you look Africa, quite many bubbles, of course Asia a little bit, uh, Southeast Asia, uh, Latin America, yes of course people are moving a lot uh, from those areas. This information is a topic that I really loved in part because when I started journalism I know for sure that in, in my country for instance in Cameroon the state media was so powerful and if the state media said something we took it as gospel truth. Just fast forward that to now when everyone has a machine on their hands and you're not exactly sure what BBC is saying and what anyone sitting in any office or any part of the world is pushing towards you and you're consuming without knowing it's a deliberate intention to manipulate you. That's how difficult this has become with respect to us making a difference between what is important, what is true, what is factually true. Of course, there's factual truth, right? We all say that and opinions. Think about it, how that has affected American democracy, how it has affected Western democracy. I wanted a BBC reporter to be in here this afternoon for us to be able to have a conversation on that. Unfortunately, for editorial reasons, they couldn't participate. Uh, but. Uh, the guy who wrote this topic and I spent a lot of time and did the video that was played at the Rio uh, 2012 summit, he recorded an interview and we're going to listen to that uh, just a few minutes uh, from now. Um, he really talks about how we've uh, sort of taken an opportunity and used it sort of, so in, in a very wrong way. Think about internet penetration, 45% in some cases in West Africa, of course not as high as other parts of the world. But there is a significant internet penetration and mobile telephony penetration in, in our region. That could significantly transform how we live as, a, as humans. But what that has done, particularly not necessarily with us, I don't know how much disinformation that there is in our system. Could be great to hear uh, the, the local journalists and how they're dealing with that in their newsrooms uh, here in Senegal. Uh, <clears throat> Perhaps I'll just end in a few minutes. Uh, biodiversity, of course, it's a topic which is obviously in the news right now. You know, of course, that this year there's going to be a new sort of architecture to be able to guide biodiversity. Uh, that's happening this year. Uh, there's going to be a big meeting in China in, in, uh, by towards the end of this year uh, to be able to uh, address that. But what you see, of course, uh, the trends are still not sustainable in terms of 
uh, most of you know how many uh, species are now categorized by IUCN as endangered. I don't know if IUCN is in the room, uh, but we actually wanted IUCN. Uh, I think that's really their area of interest to be to be here, so that we could have a very productive discussion. Uh, if we just move on a little quick, I just talk a little bit about money and most importantly here, what is known as the green bonds. Green bonds are becoming sexy, excuse the word, they're becoming common. I think that's the exact word. Uh, they're becoming common in the sense that <coughs> what you see, for instance, is even development banks, these are be becoming new windows for funding. The AFDB is doing that, and I suspect other development banks are doing that. But what you see, and I think this is very important to, to, to mention here, of course, is that increasingly, <coughs> businesses have recognized how much it is important to not only have the sort of traditional insurances they had before but even insurance related natural disasters and that sort of thing you know of course this year there was a bankruptcy in, in, in california a climate induced sort of bankruptcy that's really important it starts to tell you that we have to be sensitive about how we of course manage the collective resources we have and of course even uh, new instruments from commercial uh, banks to be able to uh, put ourselves on the uh, uh, on a sustainable trajectory. The last one, of course, is food. I'm not going to say a lot about that because uh, the panel has spoken a lot about that, and we are grateful to uh, Dr. Gay for accepting to speak a little bit on, uh, uh, on 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 what the FAO does, and particularly sort of linking, showing the interlinkages between food systems, innovations, transformation, and before that, climate change. That's important. Um, we uh, obviously in CORAF, and I suspect for all partners who are working on the food system, there is a consensus that we need to rethink how we deliver food. We need to rethink how we grow food. And of course that debate can go on and on. But we know of course that uh, given the fact that our populations are rising, climate is uh, uh, affecting us, land is degrading, and population is growing, and we have to grow more food on the same surface, you have to do it in a different way. You absolutely have to do it in a different way. Otherwise, we cannot grow the food that can feed us. And even if you did that, you have to have markets, I suspect. The trends about hunger, how undernourishment has, we are seeing the sort of trends that we saw several years ago, that we're seeing that again now, it's problematic. Because by 2015, we were almost doing better, but by 2019, we are seeing again the sort of undernourishment trends that we saw back in the early 2010s. Spurring the sort of radical change requires a lot. Of course, many people will talk about incrementalism. If you've been at this UNFCCC meetings, you see how the debates go on. There's so much talk about paradigm change. There's so much talk about making a fundamental change. There's use of transformation. But at the end of the day, sort of the policies that are agreed upon just on, can only take you to what many call incremental change. So, how do you get the sort of radical change that we all require for us to be able to move forward, I suspect, are the choices that uh, are in front of all of us uh, today and, uh, and for us development actors in West Africa. The last chapter just had to do with innovations and innovations here simply means that if there is artificial intelligence today, you can be able to write a chapter using even sort of algorithms and all sort of thing, on the, using internet applications and that sort of thing. That just tells you that the world, if we harness this possibility, we can all become better. Either by using that to cure, cure cancer, cure other diseases, or solve some of the problems that we have. Uh, sensors are now being used in many different dimensions. Actually, the sensor that picked up the 415 parts per, per million it was based in a meteorological center in Hawaii, in the U.S. It's by sensor. And sensors are used in all sectors, including even the journalism field. I don't know what's the uh, infrastructure of Senegal in terms of measuring air quality, but if a newsroom here actually wanted to be able to know what's the air quality, you can use sensors, just place them somewhere, and you can report on those. Very good quality. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I suspect that I have ended and uh, I really want to appreciate your time. I apologize that uh, I could have been a little bit long. Uh, I'd let uh, uh, our colleague from EFAT continue uh, and then we would be able to come back to the discussions later.